Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for taking the time to study the scriptures with me today. My goal is to help you teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. This week, Exodus 24 and chapters 31 through 34. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. For an icebreaker here, I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen and ask you a couple of questions. What is your favorite place to go on vacation? And then, when you've got that in mind, is it worth the wait of the drive or the plane flight to get there? Another question. What's your favorite food from your favorite restaurant? And then, is it worth the wait of the time it takes for it to be prepared? What's your favorite TV show or movie franchise? Is it worth the wait of the time between seasons or episodes? And then, what's your favorite theme park ride? And is it worth the wait of the time in line to ride it? Now, it's my guess that you probably answered yes to each of those follow-up questions. Because when you love something, when you know it has value, when you know it's going to make you happy, the wait, as hard as it is sometimes to endure, always turns out to be worth it. Well, today, as we continue our study of the exodus of the children of Israel, we're going to encounter them in a state of waiting. What were they waiting for and for how long? According to Exodus 24:18 and 32:1. And what were they waiting for? Or better yet, who were they waiting for? Moses. 32:1 tells us that the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. What's happening here is that Moses had gone up into Mount Sinai to receive a deeper understanding of God's laws. And how long did they need to wait for him? At least 40 days and 40 nights, according to chapter 24, verse 18, which is actually more of a biblical expression meaning a long time. Perhaps not literally 40 days and 40 nights, but, but I would imagine around a month or so. So picture this. They're down there waiting and waiting and waiting. Now, if they had known exactly how long Moses was going to be, if they'd been told beforehand, that would be different. But they don't know. The timing of the wait is undefined. So they're just left to, to guess and patiently wait there in the desert for further instruction from the Lord. Now, sadly, they apparently get tired of waiting and they do something else instead. Please read Exodus 32, verses 1 through 8. And I just want you to pick one phrase that you feel best describes what they decide to do rather than wait. So take a moment, go ahead and read that. And a couple of phrases that could be shared. Uh, maybe you decided to go the more direct route and pick the phrase that says, they have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it. On the other hand, maybe you chose a more generalized description of what they do. They decide to up and make them gods. They eat and drink and rise up to play. They corrupt themselves. Or maybe you noticed that they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I, or God, commanded them. And isn't, isn't that sad? especially considering all that they've seen and experienced up to this point. And consider this. You may remember that after God gave the people the Ten Commandments, back in Exodus 20, that there was one particular commandment that he repeats. And any guess at which one it was? Of all ten, which do you think God would want to reiterate to these people? And Make your guess. And check your answer in Exodus 20, verse 23. What was it? Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. It was almost as if the Lord knew what was coming. Fascinating. But they forget. 
they seem to forget all the miracles, all the signs, all the manifestations of God's power in their lives, and they quickly turn aside. Exodus chapter 32, to me, is a great study of sin, a temptation, and how that all works. Perhaps we can learn from their mistakes rather than falling into the same trap ourselves. One of the principles of sin taught here is what I would call the delay of obedience principle. If you wish to avoid the consequences of sin, be aware of the delay of obedience. And there's an interesting contrast between the timing of God's blessings and the pleasures of sin. Now, both obedience and sin offer rewards. When do they come? When does sin reward us? Almost immediately. And that's the funny thing about sin. It makes you feel good or get a benefit right then. If I steal something, I get it right then. If I give in to lust, I'm satisfied right then. If I lose my temper, I get that release right then. If I lie, I get away with it. But what about obedience? When do the rewards of obedience typically come? (laughs) There's a delay. Sometimes it takes time to see the rewards. The blessings come in the long run. If I study my scriptures every day, it may take some time before I start to see the increased faith, the deepened gospel understanding. If I honor the law of chastity throughout my youth, it may not be until I'm getting married that I realize the great blessing that living that law has been. If I pay my tithing consistently, it may be some time before I notice the overall outpouring of the windows of heaven in my life. But the blessings always come. Maybe use nutrition as an example. Eating the donut or the fast food or the bag of candy bars rewards you right then. But what are the long-term consequences? The stomach aches, the cavities, the poor health, the weight gain. Over time, all the collective consequences make for a less than desirable future. In the long run, the consequences are far worse than the fleeting initial rewards. On the other hand, initially, it's not easy to control the cravings or to exercise or to lift the weight. But in the long run, the good health, the increased ability, the self-contentment is worth it and makes your life far easier and better. It's the same with sin and obedience. Sin is easy in the short term, but hard in the long. Obedience is often hard in the short term, but easy in the long. I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is which of those two scenarios we prefer. I don't know about you, but the long term is what seems most critical in my mind. The blessings are worth the wait. But are we sometimes like the children of Israel in these things? How do we deal with the delay? Can we maintain our faith and virtue during the delay? Or will we quickly turn aside and corrupt ourselves? When our prayers seem unanswered. When we pray for healing, but the disease continues to ravage. When we pray for employment, but the rejections keep coming in. When we pray for a confirmation of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon or some other aspect of the gospel, but heaven seems to remain silent. Or what about promised blessings that don't seem to be coming? When we pay our tithing, but we still continue to struggle financially. When we strive earnestly to change, but our addiction continues to hamper us. When we're seeking repentance, but the feelings of forgiveness haven't come yet when we hope and pray for a covenant spouse in marriage, but no options seem to be presenting themselves. Can we stay faithful in these situations? We do believe in a God of miracles and answers and blessings, but we also believe in a delaying God. He is not a God of immediate gratification. As Elder Christofferson said in his most recent General Conference address, 
We ought not to think of God's plan as a cosmic vending machine, where we select a desired blessing, insert the required sum of good works, and the order is promptly delivered. Rather, we can do as Doctrine and Covenants 98.2 counsels and wait patiently upon the Lord. The children of Israel here are the opposite of Abraham and Sarah waiting for their promised child. They're the opposite of the believing Nephites of Zarahemla at the time of the sign of Christ's birth. They're the opposite of Joseph of Egypt waiting for years before he's freed from slavery and prison. Now, what's the temptation when God delays? Sometimes we make golden calves for ourselves. We make our own gods. Why? Why is it so tempting to make your own god? It almost seems silly to us now, doesn't it? Worshipping a thing that was made by your very own hands. But what's the temptation in that? Well, when you make your own gods, you also get to make your own rules. Now, my god says, make as much money as you can. My God says, be selfish. My God says, party. Uh, my God says, there's no rules for chastity. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Nowadays, most people just skip the step of actually carving out the statue to worship, and they jump right to step two and make their own rules. The effect is the same. It reminds me of Doctrine and Covenants 116. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness. But every man walketh in his own way, and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great which shall fall. So, so their idol may not be made of stone or of wood, but it does have the image of the world on it, and they walk after their own way, their own rules, their own laws. Now, as I said before, the pleasures of sin are fleeting. The party doesn't last for long. Eventually, Moses comes back. And what happens? And th th This is the part of the story that, that sets up my dad joke. Who was the first person to break all of the commandments? Well, it was Moses, right? In verse 19. And he broke all of them at once. Now, when Moses throws the tablets down to the ground. Why do you think he does this? It can be a, a good discussion question. Was it out of anger? To get their attention? To show them what they'd done? Broken the covenant? Or to show them that they weren't ready for the law? Or some other idea? And what are the consequences of their decision to make the golden calf? I, I see a few here. What's the consequence in verse 20? And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. This is so interesting. He grinds it into powder and, and makes, them, makes them drink it? Why do you think he's doing that? What's the message? No. Perhaps it's a way of rubbing their noses in their sins. So you want a golden calf? Well, you're going to get one. And also, how do you think that would have tasted? Probably pretty gross. Bitter? Certainly unpleasant. So are the consequences of sin. Like we spoke about earlier. The worshiping and partying may be fun for a time. But eventually, we're going to have to drink it all in even the bitter dregs, as repulsive as it is. Sin is never pleasant forever. And also, this would have rendered the golden calf unretrievable. It was defiled. It couldn't be used in the future for the building of the temple. Now, more consequence. What's the consequence in verses 27 and 28? And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. 
and the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Yikes! This was a bit more of a serious consequence. Some people lost their lives that day. Now, I, now I don't know, but I doubt that the killing was random and senseless. Many of the people had partaken in the revelry, but perhaps these were those who had been the ringleaders. These were those that were unrepentant, those that had been the most hard-hearted. You know, not all sin is created equal. Some are more serious than others. And I think that God recognizes this. Those who acted more wickedly received the harsher consequences. And certainly, when we sin seriously, something does die within us. Spiritual death occurs as we separate ourselves more distantly from God and his commandments. What's the consequence in verse 33? And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. There are a number of books out there where you might find your name written. A yearbook, a directory, a book that you've authored. But there's one book that's more important than any other that you definitely want to find your name written in. The Lord's book. The book of life is, is what it's referred to in Revelation. When we sin against God and worship golden calves, our names may be blotted out. Not erased, not whited out, but, but blotted out. And then what's the consequence in verse 35? And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Sin brings plagues. It brings penalties, costs, forfeitures. There's a verse that I failed to share in an earlier lesson that I think relates well here. Exodus 15, 26. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Obedience just happens to be the best inoculation that we can receive. Diligent hearkening will protect us from the plagues of sin. Well, I think that we can sum up one of the key messages of this chapter by saying, sin equals short-term pleasure, long-term penalty. Obedience equals short-term toil, long-term reward. Or in other words, endure the delays. Wait for Moses before building a golden calf. Trust in the Lord's assurances and wait patiently in obedience until the promised blessing appears. They will come. Moses will come back. It's assured, even if you don't know when. Like a good meal, your favorite show, or that beloved theme park ride. The blessings are worth the wait. To liken the scriptures here, can you think of a time when a blessing came late but was worth the wait? And please share. Moving on. The question now becomes, what if I have sinned? Uh, what if I've, I've made a golden calf and been caught bowing to it? Now what? Am I doomed? Is there any hope? And I'm happy to tell you that, yes, there is hope. The scriptures never present a problem without the solution being nearby. So now let's find some solutions to sin. You could approach this as a short handout activity as well, if you like. Can you find any solutions to sin in the following verses? 32.26, 32.29, and 32.30-32. 30 Solution 1 in verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So what's the solution? Pick a side and stick with it. We find similar encounters like this all over the scriptures. God and his prophets sometimes get to the point where they, they just draw a line in the sand and say, whose side are you on? Pick one. 
Joshua says it in Joshua 24, 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Jesus taught it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. Elijah challenged the Israelites of his time in 1 Kings 18, 21. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And then John makes that point in Revelation 3, 15 through 16. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Part of the solution to our golden calves is to make a decision and stick with it. Don't try to serve Jehovah and the world at the same time. Don't act one way Sunday but another the rest of the week. Don't try to maintain your home in Zion, but keep a summer cottage in Babylon. Solution number two, from verse 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Solution Consecrate yourself to the Lord. I think that's another way of saying repent. We can decide now to worship the golden calf no longer and consecrate ourselves to God instead. To dedicate our will and our agency to the Lord with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. This indicates a change of heart and an abandonment of sin. Repentance is the solution to sin. And if we're willing to do this, then there's a blessing that God will bestow upon you this day. Which leads us to solution number three. These next verses are beautiful, and they contrast nicely with the angry Moses of verse 19, casting the tablets to the ground. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. That's a a beautiful plea from a prophet for his people. He loves them. Even after they've committed this grievous sin, even after they've complained and murmured and backtracked so many times before, even though they don't really deserve it, Moses is willing to give up his own salvation on their behalf. He's willing to make a personal atonement for the sins of the people. Sounds like anybody else we know? Yes, Moses is a type of Christ in this thing. Even when we have corrupted ourselves, even when we've made us other gods, even when we've risen up to play or turned aside quickly out of the way, our Savior loves us enough to give us a chance to change and pleads our cause before God. See Doctrine and Covenants 45, 3-5. This is Moses as advocate, mediator, or intercessor for his people and gives us a sense of what Christ will do for those who choose the Lord's side and consecrate themselves unto him, even after they've built a golden calf or two. Just because we've sinned doesn't mean we're hopeless. There's someone out there who still loves us, as unworthy and quick to turn out of the way as we are, and makes an atonement for our sins to save us from being blotted out of the Lord's book of life. To liken the scriptures, are there any golden calves that you need to destroy? And are you willing to turn to the power of the atonement? This is yet another episode that demonstrates God's patience and long-suffering. Just as he asks us to be more patient with his timing, I believe that he is also patient with ours. There is no one more merciful, more gracious, and more forgiving than our Lord Jesus Christ. 
even though we may have to drink the bitter consequences of our poor choices at times. Our Moses is ever ready to take upon himself the justice for our mistakes. I pray we can choose a side, consecrate ourselves unto the Lord and his righteousness, and rely on the atonement and sacrifice of our Savior Jesus Christ. There's one more aspect of this chapter that I want to examine with you, and it revolves around the character of Aaron. Aaron's role in this whole thing is a bit baffling to me. I mean, of all people, he knew better than this. But it almost seems like he's the instigator of much of it. Doesn't seem to put up much of a fight when the people ask him to make them gods. As soon as they ask him, he seems to jump right in wholeheartedly and tell them exactly what to do and how to do it. How do we explain this? Well, maybe there's more to the story than we've got recorded here. Verse 1 tells us that the people gathered themselves together around Aaron. Was this intimidation? How much pressure are they putting on him? Is there a threat implied in the request? Perhaps. But the value in this episode is that Aaron here is going to teach us a very important lesson in leadership. It illustrates a common conundrum for leaders. What do I do when the people I lead desire something that's not right? What do I do when they put pressure on me to allow them to act in ways that are wrong, unwise, or contrary to God's will? Maybe you've been in that position as a leader, or a teacher, or a parent, and you know what that pressure feels like and, and how difficult it is to manage. We all want to be loved. We want to be respected and honored as leaders. But sometimes those you lead ask for things that they shouldn't or that aren't best for them. What should a leader do in those cases? Short answer, a leader needs courage. They need to demonstrate leadership. Because the lead can always place the blame for any fallout on those placed in authority over them. They could call out, hey, the buck stops with him. I think that's why they came to Aaron in the first place. If they can convince Aaron to give in to their demands then they always have somebody to point the finger at. They can say, but Aaron said it was okay. And that's, that's the tough spot that leaders often find themselves in. As a teacher, sometimes my students will put pressure on me to not have a lesson or to just play games, uh, let them talk, play on their phones instead of studying the scriptures. And they plead and they cajole and they complain. And as a teacher, you want to be liked. So the pressure to give in can be quite pointed sometimes. Well, that's the kind of situation where you've got to have the courage of true leadership. Show them real love and keep to your expectations. The same goes for parents, or for church leaders, or for employers. I like something that John Quincy Adams once said when his constituents were putting pressure on him to oppose something that he knew to be the best course of action for the nation. And in that situation, he decided to go against the wishes of his party and his electors, and was later quoted as saying, Highly as I reverenced the authority of my constituents, I would have defended their interests against their inclinations and incurred every possible addition to their resentment to save them from the vassalage of their own delusions. Sometimes we too need to resist the requests of those we lead to protect them from the vassalage of their own delusions. Leaders will often be called upon to make unpopular decisions for the benefit of the people. I mean, what parent would be so naive and foolish as to allow their children to have or do whatever they wanted with no guidance or boundaries? What teacher would be so unwise as to let their students dictate the course and direction of every lesson? What leader would be so reckless as to allow those they lead to rule them by intimidation? Leaders need courage. Aaron needed courage. He needed the counsel given in Exodus 23, verse 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. And when confronted with his poor decisions, Aaron reacts as many of us do. 
He gives excuses instead of owning the problem. He blames the people. They were the ones that came to me and said, make us gods. He blames it on human nature or the natural man when he says, thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. I mean, that's just the way these people are, Moses. You know that. And don't you just love his explanation of where the golden calf came from in verse 24? And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Uh, It just happened. Uh, Notice that he doesn't say, I made the calf. But there came out this calf. I mean, yeah, Moses, I I threw these earrings and bracelets in there, and then, poof, you know, this, this calf just came out. It's like the boys playing baseball too close to the house and they break the window. Oh, we were just playing and then the ball just flew through the window. We don't know how it happened. Or the unmarried couple who get into moral trouble and say, it just happened. No, in each of those cases, we put ourselves into tempting circumstances. We disregarded God's standards. And when the moment of temptation came, We weren't strong enough to resist it. It didn't just happen. So Aaron, this calf didn't just make itself. Sin is never an accident. Rather, hopefully we can be more like Adam and Eve after the fall. Or Joseph Smith after he lost the 116 pages. Or Alma the Younger coming to terms with the mistakes of his youth. We confess. We take ownership. We recognize the sin and our part in its occurrence. That's the only way the healing process can begin. And still, some may wonder why Aaron isn't in more trouble here. I mean, he doesn't get killed with the 3,000. In the end, it doesn't even seem like he gets a slap on the wrist. Why isn't he in more trouble here? Well, apparently he was. We do get this additional detail to the story in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 20. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. So it sounds like the Lord was going to destroy Aaron, but Moses intervenes and prays for him. The fact that he's pardoned here does seem to suggest that there may be more to the story than meets the eye. That perhaps there was a bit more pressure from the people than is suggested in the chapter. But I still believe the lesson for leaders here is an important one. When courage is needed, compromise will never work. Now, in my mind, Exodus 32 is probably the most interesting chapter of this week's scripture block and where I'd spend the majority of my time. But the remaining chapters do have some great principles to teach us as well. And to cover these, I suggest an activity. Sometimes I like to cover a large block of scriptures with an activity that I call a principle hunt. And what you do is, is I have a large list of possible principles that are taught by these chapters and a number of principles that are not taught by these chapters, just to make it more challenging. Each of your students will be provided with the following handout with all of those principles in one large list. You then divide your class into teams of four. Then you display or shout out a verse or set of verses for your students to look at. Their task is to identify the letter of the principle that matches the scripture reference. The principle that is the best match for what's being taught in those verses. The team that correctly identifies the match first wins the point. But they only get one guess. Once they've guessed the letter, Every other team will have an opportunity to guess first before they would get another chance. That discourages students from just randomly writing down letters without actually studying. Now, the way I typically have them communicate their answer is I give each team a small whiteboard and an erasable marker. They write their answer on it and raise it up into the air. And that way, I just look for the whiteboard that goes up first. Now, if you don't have whiteboards, you could always provide them with pieces of paper to write down their answers. But I found that the whiteboards work really well. 
They can come in handy for a lot of activities, so it may be worth it to invest in some. You can also pair this activity up with some kind of physical challenge as well. The team that identifies the correct answer also gets a chance to earn an extra point by, say, uh, making a basket by throwing a ball into the trash can, or making a golf putt, or shooting a Nerf gun at a target, or any number of different challenges. Be creative. So here's the list of possible principles. Okay, let's go through each of the answers and allow me to provide just a little bit of commentary on each one. Exodus 24, verses 6 through 8. The match is J. If I make and keep my covenants, the blood of the Lamb, the atonement of Christ, can bless and sanctify me. Now, at this point in the narrative, the Israelites are committing to obey and keep the commandments of God. And then Moses does something quite compelling. He sprinkles them with the blood of a lamb. Now, that sounds morbid, but we we have to keep in mind that Slaughtering animals and working around blood would have been a very commonplace and everyday kind of practice for these people. Nowadays, if we want meat, all we have to do is order a hamburger from the fast food joint or pick some up from the store, nicely pre-cut and shrink-wrapped in plastic. We are so far removed from the process that my own children didn't even realize for years that meat actually came from animals. I think they figured that Chicken nuggets and bacon just kind of grew out of the ground. That's not how it used to be. Everybody would have been familiar with the process of raising, slaughtering, and preparing animals to eat. They would have been around blood all the time and, and wouldn't have been put off by it. Blood represented life. Blood was a symbol of sacrifice. Remember the Passover. It was the blood of the lamb that protected and blessed them. Same idea applies here. When Moses sprinkles them with the blood, he's communicating that now, just like with the Passover, they are protected from the powers of darkness and evil, as long as they keep their covenant. And what had they done that gave them this kind of power? They'd made a covenant, a promise of obedience. When we make that kind of commitment, we too are protected and blessed. And it's the blood of the Lamb, or the atonement, That makes it possible. Exodus 24, 12. The match? O. Prophets teach the commandments given to them by God. And this is a simple yet critical principle. God gives the law to Moses, who in turn teaches it to the people. This is one of the ways that God communicates truth to his children. Yes, God can teach each one of us personally through the power of the Spirit. But recognizing that voice isn't always easy and and takes time and experience to develop. So God gives us another way of receiving truth. He gives us the easily recognizable and physically audible voice of living prophets. Their messages are unmistakable. God continues to work in that way. Just a few weeks ago, we were taught the laws and the words of God through the medium of living prophets. Exodus 31, verses 3 through 6. The match is E. The Lord blesses individuals with specific talents that allow them to glorify Him and accomplish His work. I really like this little principle. Every one of us has been given gifts, talents, or skills that the Lord can call on to accomplish His work. And sometimes those gifts are creative or artistic in nature. With Bezalel, God gave him skill in metalwork and jewelry. And that's a skill that I think most of us would probably not usually deem a spiritual gift. But look at what verse 3 says. The Lord says, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. This was a gift from God born of the Spirit. That special creative gift made it possible for Bezalel to glorify God by making the beautiful objects of art that would be used in the tabernacle. This truth still applies to us. In God's kingdom here on earth, we're all called to build up and glorify Zion through the gifts that we've been given. Some are called to build it up through their leadership talents, or teaching talents, or giving blessings, or faith, or healing. Still, 
Others are called upon to glorify God through their musical talents or artistic skill, architecture, sculpture, dance, metalwork, painting, and more. God is the source of those gifts and abilities. He can fill us with that wisdom and knowledge and understanding. This reminds me of a, a specific bit of counsel that was given to me in my patriarchal blessing. After telling me that I've been blessed with a natural gift of appreciating the beauties of this earth, I'm counseled to develop an appreciation for the beautiful objects of art created by the hand and mind of my fellow man, and promised that this appreciation will reflect the love of my Heavenly Father and be a source of good. I have a deep respect for those that have been blessed with that creative and artistic spirit. Heaven knows that I'm not. But that appreciation has enriched my life and my faith in many ways. Exodus 31, verses 14 through 15. The match is L. We should not take God's command to keep the Sabbath day holy lightly. And yeah, look, look how seriously he gives this command. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among the people. Six days may work be done. But in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. So, whoa, it's a pretty serious consequence. Now, today we're not going to go around killing people that fail to show up to church or we catch working a shift. The children of Israel needed very strict laws to keep them in line. But the message is clear. Keeping the Sabbath day holy is a serious commandment and, and should be treated as such. Sadly, I think that that's all been but forgotten in our society. Sabbath is much like any other day, and most of the activities we do as a society on that day are not done in the spirit of worshiping God. The consequence for this isn't sudden death, but truly, I do feel that when that commandment is neglected, we do suffer. Many die a slow spiritual death, as they distance themselves more and more from their Maker. Our bodies and spirits and faith need the Sabbath day to remain close to God and spiritually nourished. Which leads us to our next principle, Exodus 31, 16 through 17. The match is G. If I keep the Sabbath day holy, I will be rested and refreshed. Those are two of the greatest blessings that the Sabbath can provide us with, rest and refreshment. If God needed rest after creating the world, then so do we. It's good to rest from our labors. It's good to rest from the cares and concerns of the world that occupy our time and attention the rest of the week. It's refreshing. It reminds me of the story of the two lumberjacks who decided to have a contest to see who could cut the most wood in a day. The one sawed continuously throughout the day without stopping. The other at certain points, could be heard to stop sawing. And at the end of the day, the one who had taken those pauses had actually accomplished more. What was the secret? How was that even possible? He'd been taking those breaks to sharpen his saw. I think the Sabbath has a similar effect on our lives and our testimonies and our faith. The rest, refreshment, and sharpening of our spiritual saw will help us in all areas of our life the rest of the week. So is the rest we enjoy on the Sabbath day a necessity or a luxury? I'll let you decide. Exodus 33, 10 through 11. The match is P. God speaks to man. and God has a body of flesh and bone. In these verses, I love the way that the relationship between God and his prophet is described. He speaks to Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And what a lovely sentiment. The relationship almost sounds, dare I say, casual. Like God just comes down and talks with Moses. Like an informal meeting between friends. As if he's saying, hey, Moses, how's it going? Oh, Lord, it's been okay. Some of the people have been murmuring again, but I'm working with them. Oh, really? Well, let me give you some advice on that. 
you know, back and forth, and talking, and revealing, and working together. God sees man as his friend. We don't believe in a distant, uncaring, or detached kind of God. He's very much involved with our lives. In fact, we are his work and his glory. We also see in that verse that God speaks with Moses face to face. And a bit of a doctrinal truth revealed there. God has a face. He has a body. And we've been created in that image. Exodus 33, 14. The match is H. When we have the Spirit of God with us, we can find peace and rest. God's presence brings peace. When his presence goes with us, we're provided with rest. Sadly, many of us have become so busy and overworked and overwhelmed with information that we are quite a stressed out people. According to the American Institute of Stress, about 33% of people report feeling extreme stress. 77% of people experience stress that affects their physical health. 73% of people have stress that impacts their mental health. And 48% of people have trouble sleeping because of stress. Is there anything that can help us to reduce that stress and anxiety? I believe that there's something that's far more effective than pills, productivity, planning, meditation, or even exercise. It's the Spirit of God. Having the presence of God in your life can bring you rest. It can help you to keep the proper perspective on things. It can fill your heart with a calming gratitude. And it can bless you with the strength to endure with confidence and serenity. Exodus thirty-three seventeen, The match is A. God knows us by name. This is a companion truth to the verse that we just looked at in verse 11. Not only are we considered friends of God, but he knows us by name. And as a teacher, I have at least 150 different students each year. Sometimes it takes me a while to get all their names down, but I eventually do. The sad thing is that once the year is over and I get a new set of students, all the previous names seem to get offloaded to make room for the new batch. And that makes for some embarrassing moments when I inevitably run into former students. But they remember me. So it's really awkward when they're like, Brother Wilcox, it's so good to see you. How have you been? And I've got to respond with, Hey, you, (laughs) individual, uh, ah, give me the first letter. Well, I don't think it's going to be like that with God or Jesus Christ at all. God knows us all by name as his beloved children. The promise in this verse doesn't only apply to Moses or his prophets. We're not just a nameless mass to God. I believe that he knows each of us by name. And at some point in the future, I believe that all righteous people are going to have a chance to meet the Savior one by one like the Nephites did at Bountiful. And when that moment comes, I'm pretty sure that Christ isn't going to stare at us with a quizzical look and say, oh, give me the first letter. Now, Now, he's going to look at each of us with great familiarity and without a moment's hesitation, repeat our names as if he'd just spoken with us the day before. As a man speaketh unto his friend. Exodus 33.20 from the JST. The match is D. Sin separates us from the presence of God. Ah, this verse that is quoted so often in defiance of the first vision. Yet the Joseph Smith translation helps to clarify this confusing verse. It says, And he said unto Moses, Thou canst not see my face at this time, lest mine anger be kindled against thee also. And I destroy thee and thy people, for there shall no man among them see me at this time and live, for they are exceeding sinful. And no sinful man hath at any time, neither shall there be any sinful man at any time, that shall see my face and live. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts. But my face shall not be seen, as at other times. For I am angry with my people Israel. So really, the sentiment of that passage is that the sinful can't see God or Jehovah. It's sin that separates us from his presence. 
there are plenty of passages in the scripture that describe man seeing Jehovah and living. I mean, we just saw that in the very chapter itself in Exodus 33. God spoke to Moses face to face. I don't see how we can dismiss that. Exodus 34, verses 1 through 2 from the JST. The match, K. Sin causes us to lose blessings and privileges. We've got to go to the JST again for some help on this one. And there we learn something interesting about the stone tablets that Moses receives the second time he goes up to Sinai. There was a difference between the two sets. And if you read those verses, we find that because of the episode with the golden calf, God removed their opportunity to receive the power and the ordinances of the higher or Melchizedek priesthood. They weren't ready for them. And perhaps we could view that more as an act of mercy than a punishment. Higher power means higher accountability, which leads to higher condemnation. God works with us according to where we are, or the milk before meat principle. The law of Moses operated on a system of carnal commandments and the principles of the preparatory gospel, obedience and sacrifice. But there's still a sobering truth there. Sin can cause us to lose privileges and power. Through sin, we might lose our privilege to attend the temple. Through sin, we might not be able to wield priesthood power. Through sin, we may lose the companionship of the Spirit. Sin, indeed, brings loss. Exodus 34, 6-7. The match is M. The Lord is very merciful and forgiving, yet perfectly just and fair at the same time. This verse represents the dual nature of God and the divine balance in his character. Although, I like that it begins by describing his merciful side. And that side seems to be emphasized as well. Look at how many different ways that he says it. He's merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And then you have a description of the balance. He is also a God that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers. God's not only merciful, but he's just, too. He's the perfect balance between the two. Depending on who and where we're at on our spiritual journey, we may need one or the other of those messages. To the person that's too casual in their obedience or too easily dismisses sin, they may need to remember that God in no means will clear the guilty. He will not justify those with the And if it so be that we are guilty, God shall beat us with a few stripes, and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God, attitude. On the other hand, to the person laboring under the burden of toxic perfectionism or self-doubt, they may need to be frequently reminded of the God is merciful and abundant in goodness message. And I believe that the Spirit can help us to know which to apply and when. And lastly here, Exodus 34, verses 29 and 35. The match is C. Prophets reflect the glory and light of God. Yet another passage describing the role and the calling of a prophet. After speaking with God, Moses' face would shine or radiate the light of God that he had just experienced. So much so that he had to wear a veil after speaking with God. And what a great visual lesson for the people. The prophets reflect the glory of God. They're a divine mirror of that light. The words and examples of the living prophets provide our lives with a divine light that can cut through any darkness. Same light and truth that shines in heaven shines in the faces of God's chosen prophets. And we never want a lesson to just be a game with no application. We're always looking for opportunities to liken the scriptures. So as a way of capping off this principle hunt activity, have your students select one of the principles that they just studied, one that they connected with or or found the most intriguing. And for each of those principles, I have a personal application question for them to ponder. You could even encourage them to write down their thoughts and feelings 
in a journal or on a piece of paper. And here are the questions. For Exodus 24, 6 through 8, why do you think the Lord wants us to make covenants? What is it that most helps you to keep them? For 2412, what message from the most recent general conference has impacted you most? From 31, 3 through 6, what gifts do you feel God has given you to help build up his kingdom? For 31, 14 through 15, is there anything you feel you could do to more carefully keep the Sabbath day holy? For 31, 16 through 17, what do you do on the Sabbath that helps to refresh your spirit? 33, 10 through 11, when have you experienced an answer to prayer? What happened? 33, 14, what truths or commandments of the gospel bring you peace? 33, 17, what experiences have you had in your life that have showed you that God knows who you are? Exodus 33, 20, do you need to repent? And will you? And that's the same question I would put for 34, 1 through 2. 34, 6 through 7. Which of the two sides of God's character do you feel you most need to focus on right now? And then 34, 29, and 35. How has your life been blessed by living prophets? Well, I hope that those principles have blessed or, or helped you in some way. I know we didn't go into great depth on each one, or find some unifying theme throughout them, like we usually do. But remember, when consistently teaching the same group of people over time, it's beneficial to change things up a bit now and then. Variety can go far in encouraging participation and enjoyment in your class. And that's all I have for you today, my friends. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you felt the spirit. I hope you've learned something. And if you did, if you found this video helpful in any way, I invite you to share it with somebody that you feel it could help. Family member, somebody on social media, get the word out there, and I would appreciate that. If you like access to any of the resources that I make for teachers, you can go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to all of those resources. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.